All right, I think we will go ahead and get started. So thank you all for joining us for our second live webinar with Thea Markerless. We are very excited to have Thea CEO Scott Selby here with us again, and our host, Dr. Kim Duffy, our Vicon Life Sciences product manager. I've, like I mentioned, I just launched this quick poll just to see who attended the first one and what activities you might be using Markerless technology for or interested in using it for. Um, the session is up and live streaming on our YouTube channel. That's youtube.com slash Vicon. And that will be here there right after this session. Uh, if you'd like to share it or rewatch any portions. And the Q&A section is also open. So we'll be answering those possibly throughout, definitely at the end. So if any questions come up, feel free to submit those. I'll also be checking the YouTube questions. We have an integration webinar coming up on July 14th with Motion Monitor. Um, so visit vicon.com slash events or any of our social channels to find the link to register for that session and to find info on all of our other upcoming events. So with that being said, I'll go ahead and hand it over to Kim. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Alicia. As Alicia was saying, I'm Dr. Kim Duffy, the Life Sciences Product Manager at Vicon. And today is our second joint partnership webinar with Thea Markless. I'm pleased to be joined with Dr. Scott Selby, the CEO of Thea Markless, who will be providing an overview of Thea. Marcus Brown, the president of Thea Markless, is also joining us and will be monitoring the Zoom chat for any questions during and the Q&A session at the end. So before we get started, I'm just gonna run down a quick agenda so everyone knows what we're gonna be talking about today. Uh, so firstly, Scott will be introducing Thea Markless, what the company does, what the Markless requirements are, and provide an overview of some of the research outcomes using Thea Markless. Following from this, I will introduce Vicon Nexus 212 and showcase the data capture and data processing of Thea with a demo. And from this, we will be showing the data analysis process via two workflows. Firstly, Visual 3D, and then secondly, uh, using the Nexus workflow. So over to you, Scott, to talk about Faya Markless. Thanks, Kim. Here's the scariest part of the whole thing. Let's see if I can share my screen. Ah, uh, I think I'm there. Can everybody see that? There we go. Uh, I'm Scott Selby, as Kim said, and thank you, Kim, and thank you, Vicon, for giving us the chance to participate. Um, this time around, round two of, of this series, uh, I brought Marcus Brown in so that when the questions get too technical for me, I can pass them on this time. So very quickly, what we're trying to do is provide a high fidelity solution, accurate, reliable, we really are focusing only on human tracking right now. And again, this webinar is about uh, integration with Vicon Nexus. What we're trying to do is really drive an evolution in human motion tracking. We're not alone. There are other companies that do markerless. We're trying to make it robust, accurate, reliable, across a full range of activities for anyone who wants an accurate representation of human movement. We're trying to be flexible. There's no, we're trying not to make assumptions about who is being recorded or what is being recorded, or in fact, where it's being recorded. And underlying, and I'll come back to this with some caveats later, it, it's our belief that movement should be measured in the in context. And that means because we rely on video, there are many contexts for which we can measure movement and some we can't, and we, and we acknowledge that. But our goal really is to provide the ability to record in context. So this is uh, an image from, from Vicon. Uh, I'm really emphasizing two things in this video, one, in our hands and in our experience, if you want accurate 3D tracking, you need an array of cameras. And 
the more cameras you have, the smoother really the resulting trajectories become. But the accuracy can be measured by as few as even six cameras. The trajectories end up a little more noisy. This video or the image emphasizes on the left side of my screen anyway, that we're trying to track the skeleton. So we've highlighted the skeleton. We're not tracking the surface and that makes us a little different from other tracking. Our focus right now anyways, is on biomechanics. And when we're trying to understand biomechanics, we're looking at the movement of the skeleton and in an extreme setting of the analysis, what the muscles might be doing to cause this movement. So again, we're not looking at the surface, we are looking at the skeleton. What I want to emphasize is that there's nothing about our algorithm that requires us to know the movement. We're not predicting that it's walking or running or jumping, or in this case, dancing. We're solving this problem on a frame by frame basis. So regardless of what the subsequent frame is, we're looking at one, one frame, one image at a time. So here I'm going back to where I started in the first slide, and I've just added some context. Not only do we want to measure in context, we don't want to influence the performance. We don't want to affect what someone's doing. If you're analyzing a, an athlete performing, you want to record when they're performing, when they're competing, if you can. We're trying to provide an accessible solution. By that, I mean we want to limit, in some sense, the expertise of the people collecting the data. It should be point the cameras, record, and then analyze. Most important, and this often gets lost, and I'm going to get back to the validation because all our questions we get tend to be about our validation for different tasks and different people. And it keeps gliding over the fact that we're really trying to be time efficient. We're trying to provide a way that you could record perhaps a whole game, although that's a lot. But if you're doing a standard clinical gait analysis, you should be able to do your entire analysis from the subject entering the room to the subject leaving the room in five to 10 minutes. That means you can do something different. That time efficiency means possibly you could study every patient that comes through your laboratory rather than 20% of them. So it causes people who think about it to also ask different questions of the technology. If you can get a video image of someone on a field, we can analyze it. Because there's no standing trial, no movement trial, no physical measurements taken of the subject, no requirement for them to wear specific clothing, no requirement for any of that. Oops, I just went all the way back through all my slides because I don't know what I pushed. Go figure. I shouldn't be doing that in front of all you people. The big if is can you get a video image? If you can, you can analyze it. So you can put it on a practice field. I, I did this here, I'm not showing in game because, well, that's rather proprietary to the, to the teams, but I can show practice field. This is just emphasizing that we can record different movements and it allows people to track what a surprise, because it's time efficient, you can collect data on 50, 100 athletes in a day because there's no prep. The athlete can arrive, they can throw, run, jump, and then leave. So how are we doing it? We're, we're not totally unique in this. There's lots of people that use synchronized array of cameras. 
we're not new in saying we use deep neural networks. 10 years ago, it was, it was shown that deep neural networks could efficiently capture handwriting, resolve letters, numbers. It wasn't long after that before it was demonstrated that, well, if you can recognize squiggles and lines and circles, you could recognize parts of the human body uniquely. You could recognize, you know, an elbow joint or a wrist joint with a big caveat that if this network was trained to do that. So by training, we mean actually going back to my grad school days is hand annotating or hand digitizing many, many images. But in our hands, we have more than 500,000 different people that have been annotated. The deep neural networks like a lot of data. And the most accurate way is with lots of data. If you go beyond the subjects to the number of images we have, we're trying to push past a million, which I think we're at now and Marcus confirmed. But if we really had our way, we'd be at tens of millions. And the process for getting there is really kind of the magic behind it. How could you possibly get millions? We, were, we want a model of the body. We're trying to do biomechanics. We want it to have physical meaning. We want to be able to collect the position and orientation, all six degree of freedom of every segment in this model. And lastly, we do want to validate it. We have some validation has been done. We obviously want more. And I know there are going to be questions on that. And kind of my last slide goes to that. In our process, we recognize people. This slide is, is pretty simple. Two people. You can see boxes around them. That means we've identified them. There's some facial recognition. And there's some geometry. We need to do this because we have 8, 10, 12 cameras. And we have to know which subject is which in each camera. And if a subject leaves the scene, we have to be able to identify that subject coming back in the scene. The other thing this is emphasizing is how trivial it is to collect data. This is a setup at a laboratory at Queen's University, and they're just waiting for a subject. So they're just playing in the lab. Here's Marcus. I, I assume that we'll, we'll see more of Marcus later in this. You know, it's two things about this quite quickly. One, the background's rather cluttered. And two, it looks like he's got the measles. There's dots all over him. These are 3D dots. So it's kind of hard to see, but it's this cluster of features that the neural network has identified. So we track each of those features in every frame of data. And then what we do is we fit a skeleton to it much like you fit a skeleton to a cloud of points in a marker-based system, we fit it, the skeleton, to a cloud of features. We are working closely with Kevin Deluzio's lab at Queen's University. I'm not going to spend too much time. I think most people have seen it. Two of the three images below are published in the Journal of Biomechanics right now. Uh, the third one is in its second or third review, I'm hopeful. This is the work done by Rob Kanko on the right, a master's student. Elise Lande in the middle is a postdoc that's been working with this data and has collected some of it independently. Um, reviewers have caused a, a fusion of two different articles. We've measured spatiotemporal. This is a, was an interesting one because you really, it's really hard to do a comparison of, of any kind, whether it's reliability or accuracy, or even just a comparison, unless you can identify, you know, start and stop. <laughs> so the spatial temple just refers to heel strike, toe off and walking. It refers to stride length, stride frequency. This study uh, combined two different data sets 
collected differently. The, the first study was done on treadmill walking with 30 subjects and reviewers were somewhat unimpressed because they thought treadmill walking was so different and they didn't quite get the point. We only look at one frame of data at a time. So it really doesn't matter if they're on a treadmill, it doesn't matter if they're in the air. Nevertheless, the response from Rob was to ask for Elise's data and to fuse it. What Elise did was collect overground walking on those subjects and with a gate right map. So the temporal information, the spatial temporal information came from a gate right map compared to the markerless. Without dwelling on it too long, the numbers are effectively the same. Most of the data from the markerless, we didn't take take advantage of the instrumented treadmill, we said, what can we get just from kinematic identification? So the differences here in the comparison, whether it be markers or a gate right mat, are plus or minus a frame of data. Sometimes plus or minus two, but that's what's expected from kinematic based events. Repeatability, I put this in the middle, part of me wants to put it at the end, but it was the second study that was published. This is the part I think is important. What happens when someone comes back on a different day, different time, in different clothing? So this study looked at three different sessions of data. People were told to come in whatever they wore to the university that day, whatever they wore to the hospital, just wear it. You'll notice that it's not totally different from time to time. This is three different days, we're looking at joint angles, hip, knee, and ankle in all three planes. So it's mean and standard deviation, three different sessions. In fact, they're all on top of each other. The repeatability is good. Not a surprise. Not a surprise because there's no intervention. We're not, there's no inaccuracy caused by the investigator. This could have been done in three different labs by three different investigators, and we'd see the same thing that is not dependent on the investigator. This is what we get asked. We get asked it in two different ways. One is compared to markers, how accurate is markers? And so in this study, the data was collected simultaneously, time synced, spatially synced. Um, one of the challenges here is that, of course, they have to be dressed for the marker-based data. So the, the marker list is, is got markers on it. In our training set, our training set, our algorithm has never seen a marker. We're not, all of our training data is annotations. We've not used markers in any way because we didn't want to be influenced by the markers and particularly in the soft tissue artifact. On the left is the straight comparison. So these are actually segment angles. This is thigh, shank and foot relative to the laboratory. This is marker and markerless. And you can see in the sagittal plane, this is, this is pretty obvious. Nobody's too surprised by the sagittal plane. The other two planes are similar, overlapping certainly with the marker base. What I need to point out is the markerless is red. The marker based is blue. So what we're seeing is consistent recording between the two systems. The right side is showing some of the challenges in doing a comparison. On the right side, you'll see the hip flexion. And now there's a bias between marker and markerless. This is actually caused by a different definition of the pelvis. The standard gait model definition of the pelvis using ASIS and PSIS is, is tilted. The markerless comparison is, is a more vertical pelvis in the standing trial. So, if you're going to compare them, you have to compare segment angles and you have to at least explain the bias in the signals. And you can see it again in the ankle ab adduction at the bottom. Um, but nevertheless, we're measuring the same thing. 
Now, th th this is a question we get asked all the time. Um, wh when will we be ready to change? Revolution is a pretty strong word. When will we be ready for this? Well, we can't track everything, but we think we're ready now. There are many things we can track. One of the, the beauties of the neural network is if you can't track something, but you can see the subject, well, you just add it to your training set and you'll get better at it. So many questions from the round one of this webinar. When or will you validate all movements in all contexts? Boy, I'd love to, but that's a lot of movements in a lot of contexts. And we have customers kind of tackling it one at a time. But it doesn't really matter, but I understand why people want us to validate their particular activity. If we could do all of them, we would, but bottom line is we record frame by frame. So if it looks like a person, we will identify that person. If they have a neurological disorder or an injury and limp or walk with an unusual style, we will capture that. That will not affect our solution. Here's one I like. When will it affect in-game sports performance? It's already affected baseball. Baseball's already affected by it. You can find in the popular press, you can talk to the teams, People believe that you can track in game with enough accuracy to change the game of baseball. And you don't affect any particular pitch or hit, but the results, the data, it's a baseball is a data driven sport. It's already changed it. And I've got one more video, but I'll, I'll save it for later. If I could figure out how to stop sharing. It's all yours, Kim. Thank you. Thank you, Scott, for that. I assume everyone can see my screen. Um, so before we get started into the demonstration, I wanted to talk to, to you about kind of why Markless to begin with. So. A long time, uh, even before my time at Viacom, we've been progressing our optical technology to make it better and better. But now we're at the point where we and others are really seeing the value of combining different technologies. And this is what multimodal is all about. And one of the things I realized as a product manager is if there are different technologies out there being used and one doesn't fully take over all use cases, this means there's something about each of these modalities which has value. So we know, as Scott said earlier, during the last decade, markless motion capture techniques have gained uh, an increased interest in the biomechanics community. And whilst the level of accuracy and reliability is not as comparable to optical, more users are seeing a benefit in adopting this uh, multimodal data capture. So why combine optical and markless? Well, with this rise in markless interest, our users are wanting a way to facilitate uh, and combine data capture of different modalities and assess this software in a streamlined manner. So we have several uh, Viacom Fair customers who are evaluating this rise in technology and for our first phase validating how this compares to optical. So before discussing the workflow, I want to briefly discuss the system setup. So FAYA requires a minimum of six video cameras. However, they do recommend eight video cameras. For the Vicom FAYA integration, we're using the Vicom View video camera. This camera has a very focal lens, which allows the ability to adjust the field of view. A requirement for FAYA is it must be able to see both the head and feet to successfully track subjects. 
As the uh, view video camera has a very focal lens, this enables the field of view to be adjusted for the desired motion and subject video capture. And with our cameras having individual ethernet cables, we're ensuring sufficient power and allows our users the ability to easily move the cameras based on their desired capture. And we know thermal drift is one area that affects motion capture accuracy. Therefore, we do advise a camera warm up period before calibration and a controlled ambient temperature. Under some circumstances, such as temperature changes, lenses can change calibration, which makes it difficult to reuse factory lens parameters in all circumstances. We are the only motion capture provider that updates the intrinsic component of the calibration process, so no longer using the linearization grid method at Factory. The ability to recalculate the internal calibration parameters is desirable as thermal drift affects system accuracy, so we can account for this. So what is the workflow for capturing FAIR data? Firstly, we capture all the data within Vicon Nexus. Um, and the benefit of this is that all the capture and processing and analysis can be done within uh, Vicon Nexus. So we'll automatically launch FAIR 3D. And this is done in a seamless integration uh, within our Nexus software. So before I go into the demo, I want to break down these sections to explain what is happening. So you can see that through the demo today. So as I mentioned on the previous slide, all cameras and third party devices are connected into Nexus. So this is Nexus 2.12. Um, this includes if a user is wanting to also capture optical data as well as force play, EMG, IMUs, for instance. The second part, once you've got your system connected, we obviously need to calibrate the system. We calibrate the system to ensure sync and alignment between our data sources, but it's also a requirement for FAIR 3D as all video cameras must be calibrated and synced in order to process within the FAIR 3D software. And then once the system's been calibrated, we're then able to capture our data. I'm sure pretty much everyone here today is familiar with the data capture process within Vicon Nexus. And I'm pleased to say it's the exact same workflow if you're capturing data for FAIR as well. Um, you're not having to do anything different. Once you've captured your trials, uh, we need to transcode these. Um, so one of the benefits of the Vicon view camera is it records uncompressed uh, video so a user can choose the best quality codec for their video data needs. FAIR requires specific codecs to process the video files and FAIR runs on the NVIDIA graphics card so they only support those graphic card solutions for codecs. So by capturing uncompressed video, as the codecs improve over time, we're allowing our users the ability to improve the video quality. So once the data has been transcoded, the video files, we can automatically launch FAIR 3D and process the video files within the background. Uh, once the processing of the video files has been done, this will automatically export those C3D files back into Nexus. One thing to know, within the FAIR 3D software, you are able to display the joint outputs. However, these do not get saved within the C3D file. The only information the FAIR C3D file provides is the rotational 4x4 matrices. So it doesn't calculate the joint angles. This can be done, ha however, within Nexus itself or using Visual 3D. And part of this webinar today, we're going to be showcasing both of those workflows. So what I'm going to do now is showcase um, the data capture and processing of uh, FAIR. In the interest of time, I have pre-recorded from earlier today, um, just to ensure we have enough time to capture. So we've uh, connected 26 Vantage cameras and eight Vicon View cameras into our system. For this data capture, we had our subject, Al, 
uh, doing a full body plugging gate marker set. And what we've done here is I've actually set up an automatic data capture. So you can see that when you start cap, the data will only start to record uh, when the labeling hits 90% and it will automatically stop once it hits 65% of the marker and labeling. This means that I don't have to be next to the PC during this. I could be out in the volume interacting with my subject if I needed to. So for this uh, demonstration, we captured free trials. And in the interest of time, I'm only processing two of those trials. So as I mentioned earlier, once you've captured your data, we need to transcode them to uh, give the right codec. So the codec we are using is an AVI, um, uh, sorry, a, dot, a MOV file, uh, which is part of the recommended FFD show uh, codec. So this will just take a few seconds. Um, whilst I'm sharing on the screen as a manual process, this can be done by a, a batch process as an automated pipeline. So once the data uh, for the video files has been transcoded, what you can see here is we've got a new tab called FAIR in our communication. And what this will do is, as you can see, I press process all files. It will automatically launch FAIR 3D and automatically detect how many trials are required to process within FAIR 3D. Uh, so you can see within our log area within this tab, you can see it's identified the two uh, two trials that we transcoded and now it's starting to process the first trial walk zero one. It does take a few, few seconds for FAIR to upload and it will then appear. Now one of the benefits of this integration is it, it can run in the background so if you do want to process optical data at the same time you can do that and just let FAIR run and do its processing in the background. And because we've got this update progress bar in Nexus, you can see how far you've got through the processing. So you're able to continue doing other things at the same time, as it does take uh, several minutes to process one uh, video trial, especially the more video cameras you've got, the more trials uh, you, um, more time it will take. So what uh, FAIR has done, it's automatically, with this integration, it's automatically uh, imported the video files and the calibration files, and it's processing through, which I will hand over to Scott in a bit to talk about the specific processing. But whilst what we can do whilst that's processing is we can open up the captured data of the optical and third party and start processing that. So you can see here on the screen, I've created um, a pipeline that can do all that process in one go. So I've unselected the FAIR component for the time being has the data is still processing for that side. So I'll, I'll go back and rerun that pipeline for that side once that's processed. But you can see here that whilst this has been processing, I've been able to load in the optical data and, um, and put my events in automatically and process uh, for the plug-in cape model. Scott, is there anything you want to add of the process while, um, while this is showcasing? of what's happening in the FAIR 3D software? No, well, it's a little difficult to, to, to tell. Um, it's doing just what we described earlier. It's identifying the subject. It's identifying the features. Uh, it's then fitting uh, a model to the, to the data. The, the model used in Visual 3D, or in Thea 3D, I said Visual 3D, I didn't mean that. Uh, in Thea 3D is, is flexible enough that for many of the segments, uh, you can solve the pose of each segment with six degrees of freedom. The, the restricted joints are really, at this point, the elbow, 
uh, the knee and the joints of the fingers. Uh, it is possible, the six degree of freedom means that the model that's generated in the end doesn't require to see the entire subject. So if you're only seeing the upper extremities, that's what's gonna show up in the model. Um, now I will add that the neural networks like to see all as many features as they can, but it can be done seeing only partial, partial model. Uh, I don't wanna get in your way here, Kim. Um, yeah, that's so fine. The, the, go ahead. No, 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 you're absolutely fine. Oh, I'm gonna I keep talking. Okay. Um, the time, the time it takes to do this, via 3D is heavily dependent on the graphics processors, the GPUs, and the processing time scales linearly with the number of GPUs. So the more GPUs sitting on your computer, the faster this, this goes. So this trial running on Marcus's computer, for example, Marcus probably confirmed is probably 10 to 20 seconds. Um, these days, that's really not that fancy a computer. I suppose it was not that long ago. Uh, but it, it's, it's certainly possible to, to get this down more efficiently. But, the, the, but processing in the background, of course, just means you can do other things. Exactly. So. And that's what we're showcasing on the screen here. You can see that progress bar where um, that we were going through and we were able to do everything else in batch process while waiting for that. Um, so what we're going to showcase now is the Nexus Faya Visual 3D workflow. So we're not going to repeat what we've just showcased right there in the interest of the time, but just to recap what we've just shown. So we've captured data within Nexus. We automatically launched Faya 3D and that run the process of identifying the, each subject that was in. In this particular video trial, we only had one subject. And from there, what we're gonna showcase is the uh, launch of processing the data within Visual 3D. So what I'm gonna do is hand over back to Scott so he can showcase that uh, demonstration. Uh, okay. I'm getting these nasty messages from Zoom. Um, Start your video. Okay, so as Kim said, this was recorded earlier. I should probably let Marcus go through it. So you can see this part of Thea, you can see all of the, I'll stop it for a sec here. I'll try to stop it without killing everything like I did earlier. Um, you can see the eight views, camera views, and you can see that the end result of the processing you just watched is a skeleton in 3D, you see the 3D representation on the right. Um, what you're seeing on the left is not the feature detection in each image, but it's actually the final 3D skeleton then projected back onto each video image. Um, part of this is just quality assurance. You can look at the skeleton to see if it makes sense. Um, and as I said earlier, if it really doesn't make sense, you've done something that we didn't expect. Um, you've got your, your leg up over your head because you're extraordinarily flexible. I don't know that we have that many images of that. If something like that happens, you could just send us the image and we'll just add it to the data set. We'll, we'll kind of correct it. Um, <clears throat> let's play it some more. So for display, do you often want to save this um, overlay? And you could save all of them, but normally you just want to save one view. So Mark is just showing that you can just save one view. So here's the overlay, the calculations, and we're going to save one video overlay to disk. So that, that could be what you're presenting to your patient if you just want to show them, or it could be what you're presenting to an athlete. It's a little different than presenting an animation to an athlete. The overlay contains information that most people are used to seeing. People in biomechanics are used to seeing a skeleton, but uh, an athlete is probably not used to seeing a skeleton of themselves. So now they get to see both. Launching Visual 3D is really just selecting Visual 3D for analysis. So because the model 
it comes from Thea. Visual 3D just recognizes it and automatically builds the model. So there's no process of having to find the standing trial, uh, no process of figuring out where your files are. When you load a movement trial, that automatically builds a model. And as you can see, it's kind of a fake model because it's just the geometry of our subject is scaled. And it shows the reference frames. And this is visual 3D. So for those of you who want your different orientation of reference frames, go for it. Um, what you're seeing in this view is just exactly what you'd expect to see in visual 3D, a skeleton walking. And on the left side is all the data. At this point, all of the processing available in visual 3D is available in visual 3D. There's no difference between the pose of a markerless skeleton or the pose of an IMU skeleton or the pose of a marker-based skeleton to visual 3D. So you can report in exactly the same way. You can use your old reports and just run through the data. And, and Marcus is just going through this very basic report. You can see some problems with this data set in, in axial rotation, um, particularly at the power, which, which means that there's probably some noise in the data. But this is just standard data at this point. Really want to emphasize that some of this is automated. So within Visual 3D now, there are automated processing for some people. So you can actually just have a model buried inside the Visual 3D code. Uh, not sure. Maybe Marcus wants to address what Marcus is showing in the rest of this video. I think he's just running through different um, report pages. But in, in effect, this is this is all done. And we're done. It's all yours, Kim. Thank you, Scott. I'll reshare my screen now again. So um, we've seen the demonstration from the visual 3D side. And as I mentioned at the beginning, we're also able to do the data analysis within Nexus. So for users that don't have visual 3D or not sure how to use it, we can do this within Nexus. So this is what I'm gonna be showcasing now. So firstly, just to recap everything again, capture all data, optical if you want, or just video, uh, video only within Nexus 212. We then are able to automatically launch via 3D and this will bring back in the C3D files back within to Nexus. And then the final part of this is we're then able to process the data to get the joint uh, angle outputs within uh, Nexus. Now we're using Vicon ProCout, which is a free software that runs off our Nexus license. So all users that have Nexus has ProCalc access. And ProCalc is a biomechanical wizard-based software solution uh, that is fully integrated within Nexus. So any ProCalc schemes that you've created, you could automatically run them as a pipeline operation within Nexus. And that is what I'm gonna be showcasing today. The pipeline operations that are readily available within Nexus to process and analyze the FAIR data. So just to summarize exactly what we're, what that process means is, firstly, um, all data is comes back into Nexus. So you've got two parts of this, as you saw from our demo earlier, we captured markerless, but we also captured optical data as well. So they are currently two separate C3D files. And what a user like yourself wants to do is you actually want that together. So what we've got is an operation that allows you to merge that fair rotational information into the Nexus C3D file. So from there, you're able to have your fair data alongside your optical and third party, such as your force plates. So that's the first operation. It's the merging side uh, within, within Nexus. From there, once that data has been merged, if you've got optical data, if you haven't, you don't need to do the merge, you can then run the FAIR ProCout scheme. There's two different schemes we provide. The first one provides the bones and joints. So for those that want to display FAIR data within Vicon ProCalc in their reporting solution, that offering is available. And then the next one is then to be able to calculate the joint angle output. So what I'm gonna showcase now, again, this is pre-recorded because of time, um, 
the workflow to then process that data within uh, Vicon Nexus. So you can see here, I've loaded in the trial of our first capture, which was uh, the first walking trial we did. So you can see here, I'm selecting all eight video cameras just to showcase um, the overlay. So you can see I've got the overlay of the plugging gate from the optical data currently. So what we're gonna do is run all this automatically in one pipeline operation. So you can see I've just got one click and that has merged the data of FAIR rotation and C3D within the Vicon Nexus C3D file. And then uh, from there, it has uh, calculated the joint angle output. So you can see on this, it might be a little bit hard to see here, but we do have uh, more information now. You not only have you got the plugging gate bones, but you've also got the FAYA bones as well visualized in. Because it's markless, you need something to be able to see. And in addition, within the subject, we've also got the outputs for the joints. So what I'm doing now is selecting uh, the knee joint for both FAYA and uh, optical just to showcase that comparison between the two. So I'm going to put a, a color, uh, color on in a second to label it. So we've got the knee flexion extension for both FAYA and also uh, the optical data within Nexus. And the key will show that the darker color green is the plug and gate model. And then the lighter color green is the FAYA output. So from there, we could then add this all to quick report, which you can see in the middle and give you a report, or you could then go into Polygon and or Python or MATLAB if you wanted to further process that data or just do a report. So thank you for listening uh, to us today and uh, we're happy to take any questions uh, any of you have. Um, on the screen is our contact information if you want to get contact with us directly or, um, or any of our social channels. So thank you so much. Thank you, Kim. Thanks, everyone. Marcus, would you like to join us now? Uh, you actually muted, Marcus. Hey, sorry, everyone. Thank you very much for uh, the opportunity here. And Scott has been referring to me, and I've been um, in the background. So he's done quite a great job of describing uh, everything that we do here. So I just want to thank everyone for participating and for Vicon for hosting us. And we welcome questions. The Q&A is um, pretty quiet right now. So if there are any questions, please, um, please ask. Maybe um, while we're waiting, I know Marcus, you answered some of the questions offline. Uh, so maybe do you wanna just run down a couple of those ones until we get any more? Sure, sounds good. So there are some uh, questions uh, regarding golf swings and whether that is in, included in our data. And typically the way that we approach the, um, whether it is within our data set is we just look at sample data to determine our confidence um, with respect to the output, not necessarily finding examples within the data. However, I can tell you for a fact that there is quite a bit of golf data within our data set, as I've seen all of it. So that uh, should be well captured. So we do have a couple more questions coming in, guys. So thank you for that. So um, Kim, the first question is regarding um, camera constraints and the distribution within the volume. So our requirements um, are kind of twofold. So the first is based on visibility of the person, and the second is based on the size of the person. So in terms of visibility, that can be affected by many factors. So one could be occlusions within the volume, so if there's objects in the way. So effectively, we need to be able to see key features. Another uh, factor within with respect to visibility is also lighting. So the litmus test we use for visibility is if you look at the picture and it looks like key features are the parent, so you can see the knee joint center, you can see the shoulders, then that's kind of our constraint. With respect to the distributions of the cameras, our, the size of the person, our recommended size is between three and 400 pixels. So if they are 
very far away from the cameras and they are only 50 pixels tall, then that makes it very difficult for us to reconstruct a skeleton. So that's kind of where our size and distribution um, come into play. Now, with respect to the bike on view cameras, they do have a very focal lens. So you can kind of modify these, uh, both of these factors within your volume given a certain camera setup. If that didn't answer your question, please ask again, but I think that may have captured it. We do have, um, we have one in the chat, but we also have two others and these are fail ones. So I'll ask these. So I feel like I'm a part of this. Um, the system, is the system able to cope with partial figures throughout the full video, i.e. never any lower limbs visible? Uh, yes. So the way that the skeleton is set up is that we have basically a series of partial skeletons. So as you can see, as you can see from those videos, there's a disconnect between the lower body and the upper body. So if, for example, you're sitting at a chair and the de there's a desk that's including your entire lower body, but there's visibility on your upper body, then we track the upper body alone. And the same is true for the lower body. Now, the caveat with that is that we are better at tracking full bodies than we are at partial bodies. So if you are tracking at a desk, for example, the visibility just has to be um, quite good in order for us to perform tracking like that. Thanks. Um, this is from Chad. Thanks for the talk. Does the Markless system recognize people and faces of different skin colors? Uh, thanks for the question, Chad. And we actually get this uh, question quite often. And the answer to that is yes. So the data set that we have is, is very diverse from an ethnicity standpoint. And another kind of ex example that we use with respect to this is that primarily within our data set, everyone is clothed. So there is a significant representation of different colors and not only different colors of people, but also different colors of clothing. So we do not have kind of bias with respect to, um, to different ethnicities. Now, the only caveat with that is that it's based on quality of image. So if you, if me, for example, I'm quite light skinned in a very bright room, there can be washout on my skin and that isn't ideal from a feature perspective. So really the, the differences with respect to skin color and clothing are generally addressed through lighting changes within the room. Great. Um, and then the next one before, there's one in the chat, uh, there's, oh, there's two in the QA. Can you list some of the examples of fair movement screen activities that you have for a large data set for? So for example, um, FMS, hop jumps, et cetera. Yeah, so in terms of our, our data set, we, our entire data set is static and isn't from videos of particular activities. Now, for those activities that you're mentioning here in terms of those examples, those are, we consider those to be predominantly vanilla, which basically we have significant amounts of data that are similar to them. And we wouldn't really consider adding additional data of that variety because it's already well contained within our data set. If that answers that question, I'm happy to extend on it. I'm sure we'll get another follow-up if it hasn't. Uh, the next one, is it possible to record with high accuracy movement of fingers and hands? Very possible. So we have our hand algorithm is currently in a late alpha, early beta stage. The difficulty with hands is that typically we are large capture volume where the size of the hands are very small. So currently, yes, we are testing um, algorithms with respect to hand movement measurements. And then there is one in the chat. I, uh, it's to do with pricing against Capture. And um, yes, um, it's from our YouTube channel. Um, so I don't know whether you want to answer this live or uh, message them back afterwards on that particular. Yeah, question. we can. We can. Uh, one of our reps can message back with, with respect to pricing. Um, the next question, Vicon, can you share what the sampling rate range is for the markless cameras for the golf swing or pitching, et cetera? Um, so for today's capture, we did it at 120 hertz, which is the currently the highest capture rate we can do for our video camera. We can go higher for the um, marked optical solution, depending on the camera. Hopefully that answers the question. Just see if we get any more in. Uh, 
I should note, uh, Donna, we have done golf swing with our uh, bike on view camera and it did track it. Um, as it was just during that rotation where the, the hand movement, but as Marcus was saying, they're working on that algorithm. So that'll improve over time as well. Yeah, and that's a really good point actually, Kim, with respect to just generally collecting um, video data is that as our algorithms improve, there is a real possibility, and this is actually pretty standard within our current um, customer base to reprocess data. So it's not the case where you haven't instrumented the subject and you cannot go back and reprocess the older data. It's the case that the input source is always the same. So if you have clear visibility as the algorithms improve and become more general and become more intricate with respect to not only the cases that we're able to track, but also the number of key points that we're tracking, you have the flexibility to reprocess all of your historical data, which is typically what our clients do. So as we produce a significant improvement to our algorithm, then they go back and automatically reprocess their data to include those improvements in the historical data as well. So they can always compare their existing data to their previous collections. Yeah, and, and you could do it the same way we showcased today. So you could rerun it back within Nexus and then just do a direct comparison between the previous captures, as Marcus said. We do have another one. How much improvement is expected in future Nexus Fair 3D releases on transcoding and processing time of videos? So in terms of the transcoding, that to me was relatively quick. So Kim, was that, how many, was that maybe 10 seconds? Yeah, 10 seconds. I think it was slightly slower because I was recording the screen as well. So it did increase maybe a few microseconds on there. Yeah, so that part is, I think, going to be relatively static in terms of its speed, but it's still quite quick for 16 videos. Now, in terms of our Thea speeds, in the release that Kim was showcasing now, our, we actually have a release that went out today, which is approximately four times faster. So we have a, a serious emphasis on making this accessible from not only a collection perspective, but also a reasonable expectation in terms of processing time. So the videos that, as Scott mentioned, the videos that Kim has processed here take approximately 15 seconds each on my computer. Yeah, and, and that at the minute, I guess it kind of comes to the point that as the processing power PCs get better and they improve over time, that will also reduce the processing time here that we're showcasing. Um, we are, as we said, we they've just released new NVIDIA graphics cards, so they're also going to be coming into our operation soon, so our demos will be coming even more quicker. Um, the next question is, have you done anything with swim starts, arm movements that aren't mostly vertical in body orientation possible? Uh, yeah, we have, absolutely. So we haven't done anything specifically to swim starts. We have a current actual Vicon customer, um, Vicon Anthea customer, that they're analyzing these bird dog movements, which is kind of uh, on all fours and then raising uh, your one arm and your contralateral leg at the same time. So those type of movements are obviously more tricky to, uh, to track because you have a lot of self-inclusion. So the anterior side of your body is um, fully occluded. Now, the benefit to our system is because we track so many points on the body, if you do have anterior occlusion, that's actually okay because we have posterior points as well that are being used to track. So for that question, a swim start, I wouldn't be too concerned about um, the tracking of that. We have one on our YouTube channel. After setup, how long does it take to fire up this system and get it streaming into an Unreal Engine? So I think this is from an entertainment customer. I don't know if you guys have tried that. Currently, we do not stream live into an Unreal Engine. So it would take several minutes to process and then stream the post results afterwards. I guess we'll get a follow-up question to that if they want any more. Yeah. And if they want more, uh, if they want more information regarding our entertainment uh, integration, feel free to send us an email. Yeah. So I'll just, in case we have any more questions before we end, I will just reshare my screen just because this gives all our contact information. Um, so if anyone does have any questions for us um, and it's not being answered here, we're happy to take them both from the fair and bike on side. Okay, I think we've answered all the questions this time, which is good. Um, so uh, just again, thank you so much, 
Scott and Marcus for joining us today for the round two. Um, I hope you all enjoyed it. And as we said, if you have any follow-up questions and want to know more, um, please get in touch. Uh, thank you for thank you, and uh, we'll see you hopefully soon in person. Thank you so much. Thank you, Cam. Thanks, thank everyone. You, Cam.